All right, welcome to our brief introduction to population. The lecture is, of course, by myself, Chris Gall. And if you're in my class, you know we're using interactive notebooks this year. And so the notes for this lecture are to be taken on the right side of page one of the second section of your INB. So that's the population and migration section. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about really in this lecture two topics. We're going to talk about density, and then we're also going to talk about um, distribution. Okay, so population density in and of itself comes in three varieties in human geography, and you're probably most familiar with our first one, which is to say arithmetic density. And this is the one you probably learned in, in science, because it's a pretty common one, and it literally is basically an average. Okay, so it's the number of people per the unit of land. This includes all land, whether it's usable or whether it's not. Okay, so <clears throat> it's just a real baseline number there that kind of tells you as an average how many people are in any given area. Then you've also got physiological density which is the number of people per unit of arable land. Okay, And arable land specifically is farmable. So here we're only looking at the land that's actually being used for farming or that could feasibly be used for farming. Okay, And it's really this is a measure of how efficient the farming is. So how many people can the can the arable land support, if that makes sense, okay? And how good of a job is that, that land doing of supporting it? <clears throat> and our last type of population density is agricultural density. And agricultural density is really the number of farmers per unit of farmland. And this one really helps us to account for differences in development. So if there's a large ratio, right, then it's a low level of development. So if there's lots and lots of people farming, then there, it's not a very highly developed, and remember development in this case, we're talking about economic development, okay, just to be clear, it's not a very economically developed country, because most people are farming to try and support themselves. If, on the other hand, it's a very small ratio, then that's a very high level of development, okay, so if there's very few farmers for each unit of farmland, that means most of the people in that society are off doing other things. They're able to do those other things because the farming is very efficient and very effective. <clears throat> so it's supporting lots and lots of people. Okay. The second concept we're going to talk about is distribution. And distribution really just refers to how things, or in our case, since we're talking about human geography, we're going to talk about people. How are people spread out in space? And on the next slide, there's actually a map that shows... There's a dot density map that shows human population distributions. But just know that distribution itself comes in really two major varieties. It's either clustered or it's dispersed. And we look at that next slide, I want you to pause the video for just a moment and take a look and really see. And you'll notice that there's big population clusters in Europe. There's a big population cluster in eastern China. And there's another big one in India. And there's also one or two more major population clusters in the world. And then there's a number of secondary population clusters in the world. Okay, And cluster just means that everybody lives close together, that there's lots and lots of people on the land. Okay, <clears throat> You'll also notice that there's some areas with very dispersed populations. So for example, most of Canada, the population is very, very dispersed. Um, much of the Canadian population, if, and I forget the exact percentage, so you'll forgive me, lives within about 25 to 50 miles of the American border and then the rest of Canada the population is very very spread out. Saharan Africa is much the same way. There's a few people who live in Saharan Africa largely they tend to migrate and move around a lot right they engage in a lot of cyclic movement <clears throat> and Eastern Russia and Eastern Russia of course is that Siberia area um, and there's just not a lot of people who live there. So when we look at what factors influence population distribution, and this is the uh, map that I was telling you, right, where we've got those those major, you can see the different population clusters, right? Um, there's a number of factors that influence where people decide to live. Okay, so first of all, people tend to avoid areas that are too cold. For example, northern Canada. Or Alaska, right? I'm from Alaska, so I can point out without too much trouble that it's it's way too cold for people to live, especially northern Alaska. 
very it's way too cold to live easily um, which is why people tend to avoid living there they also tend to avoid living in places that are too high for example the rocky mountains right and you'll forgive me if that's not exactly in the rocky mountains but it's close and you get the idea right and those areas that are too cold and too high can overlap right so as you get high up into the mountains it does tend to get colder but you, there's lots and lots of areas that are cold that are not high so it's important to kind of draw a distinction there as well those areas that are high up in the mountains the air tends to be thinner um, and it's it's in general just much harder to live the soil is much rockier and things like that also areas that are too wet like for example the rainforests <clears throat> right and again rainforests there's lots and lots of plants but there's also lots and lots of animals um, and the soil because of all the rain the soil tends to leach a lot of nutrients and as a result it's actually not all that that good for supporting people right um, and the last characteristic of areas where that people tend to avoid are areas that are too dry for example deserts so i highlighted there the the sahara desert it would be just as easy to point out the gobi desert or um, as one of the kids in class pointed out right death valley would be an area that's definitely too dry for people to live in and what all these things all these places tend to have in common though is essentially is that they're too you can't farm them they're too hard to farm and that's why people tend to avoid living there because in order to really support populations there they're either importing their food or they're hunting and gathering to make that work <clears throat> Or in the case of a lot of folks who live in the desert, they're engaging in some kind of cyclic movement so that they're moving into areas that have food and stocking up and then moving back out into areas that don't and then back and forth. Okay, but that's really what all of these areas have in common <clears throat> is this idea that they're areas that can't be farmed. So in our very quick, very brief introduction to population, we talked about two major factors. We talked about population distribution, right? So that's quite literally the where do people live and why do they, why are they living there? And then we also talked about population density. We talked about three different kinds of population density. We talked about arithmetic density. We talked about physiological density. And we talked about agricultural density. And each one of those measure density in slightly different ways. And they yield slightly different information. And they get used for different things. For the most part, if you see a news report, for example, and it's talking about population density, they're talking about that arithmetic density because that's just a nice basic easy number to use and each one of those distri distribution versus density has its strong points if you were in class today <clears throat> I would have had you turn and talk and we've got our compass partner sheets right so that we've got a variety of people we can talk to and ask you to think about and this is one you can think about on your own at home which one do you think is more useful density or distribution if you were trying to describe the population of an area and why that one so if you want to pause the video for just a moment think about an answer then we can go ahead and come back and I'll talk a little bit about the strengths of each <clears throat> okay so really you should know first of all that this question was phrased deliberately vague specifically because depending on really what information you're trying to give or how you're trying to describe a population you could actually use either one right if you're just talking about population broadly and you're just speaking in generalities density is a great thing to use especially that arithmetic density if on the other hand <clears throat> you're starting to look at and dig into more of the geographic aspect of it remember geography where and why there that's where distribution starts to come in handy so if we flip back for just a quick minute and we want to look at say the North America map there <clears throat> we might look and notice that there's a big population cluster in the nor in the eastern United States right so then we start to think about and talk about why are people so clustered in the eastern United States and why are they so dispersed in the middle of the United States right and then we can get into and we talk about historic migration patterns we can talk about where are the major cities and urban areas in the United States we talk about conurbation and all those kinds of things that play into why people decide to live where they do and if you notice on the west coast for example right right along the ocean there's several 
major population clusters as well. And if we were zoomed in, you'd see those look actually quite large and similar in many ways to what you see on the East Coast. So <clears throat> if it were me, I would say distribution, but that's just because distribution gives you a little more specific information. Some of my favorite answers in class today use density as a way to talk about distribution. So people were talking about looking at, for example, chloropleth maps with the different colors and saying, well, if you use average population densities and then you use that as a way of comparing distribution within an area, for example, say population densities in the United in individual states as a way to show distribution of people in the United States, right? Um, that's a really great way to tie in both of those ideas and use them both. Um, but just know that really you could talk about either one and either one would be correct and it's all really about how you defend it and how you're looking to use the information. The other thing of course with an INB is that you've got your notes on your right side and something fun and creative, some way to think through the information on the left side. So if you're doing this at home on the left side what I want you to do is put together an acrostic poem about density and distribution and you can just use the words density and the word distribution, you don't need the word and in the middle. Okay, acrostic poems are the ones where each line of the poem starts with a letter of the key terms, right? In this case, the words density and distribution. I used my name up there because I don't want you copying my homework. <clears throat> okay, a few things to remember. One is that poems make sense. They're not just random collections of words. So they're collections of words around a theme, right? So in general acrostic poems, the collection of words would be about whatever that word is that goes down the side. So, you know, I said Ms. Gall and listed some traits of myself that, or some things related to me that people may use to describe me, <clears throat> right? But you're going to do that same idea only with density and distribution on the left side of page one of the population section of your notebook. So if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to hear about them in class and I will see you the next time I see you.